Many of New York City's fine old neighborhoods stand at a crossroads. Aging housing and infrastructure can crumble into disuse or they can be revitalized to serve new generations. Which way will the city go? I'm David R. Jones, president of the Community Service Society of New York. Today on the Urban Agenda, we'll look at how private and public forces can come together to help endangered neighborhoods. As our guests, we have two veteran community activists. Michael Rushford is executive director of St. Nicholas Neighborhood Preservation Corporation, a 22-year-old community development corporation currently working to re revitalize the Greenpoint Williamsburg area of North Brooklyn, and Richard Perez, director of community development at my organization, CSS, heads up our comprehensive community initiative, which is mobilizing residents of Gates Avenue, Brooklyn, to improve housing and living conditions in that area. Well, gentlemen, let me start with you, Michael. Uh, how, what, what kind of conditions do you face in Greenpoint? Uh, what, what's going on there? Why does it need any help of the kind uh, St. Nick's is providing? Well, when we uh, began our organization, uh, we had a substantial uh, building abandonment uh, problem. Um, our commercial district had been uh, had a, about 25 percent vacancy rate. Our yeah. industrial jobs had hemorrhaged, and over the last 20 years, we've really been working to improve that. Uh, all those buildings have now been rehabbed. Uh, we have a much lower occupancy rate um, on our commercial district, and we've created um, some 3,000 jobs within our uh, community. Uh, today we're facing a different set of issues um, and focused really on community building and how do we take the, build the infrastructure of our neighborhood uh, on another level. Right. Richie, in terms of our work in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Gates Avenue, what's it like there? What's going on with this community? Well, first of all, Bed-Stuy um, is the largest African-American community in New York City. And within it, in the area that we're working on, Gates Avenue, is a corridor of high-density buildings uh, made up of Gates Avenue houses, which has um, 160 units, uh, Mega Everest houses, which has 315 units, and Willard J. Price, which has another 190 units. Um, altogether, we're talking about probably close to 2,000 people. And these buildings were all owned privately by slumlords that were just sucking the money out of them not doing repairs, not dealing with security, and at the same time getting millions of dollars in federal subsidies um, which they were putting into their pockets. And a year ago we began, um, our ownership transfer uh, program began organizing tenants into a tenants association and with the support of Brooklyn Legal Services began a legal uh, litigation strategy to get rid of and challenge the old landlords and get them out. Mm -hmm. And so in one year we've been successful in um, getting rid of the landlord in the Gates Avenue houses that buildings have been put into receivership. Um, the Medgar Evers houses in the process. The lawsuit is happening already. And in both Gates Avenue and Medgar Evers, um, tenants associations have already been formed. Um, we're beginning to see repairs getting done. We're beginning to see the security um, situation change there. And as the housing situation begins to stabilize for many of the residents, and the most active of whom are uh, women and grandmothers, um, what is beginning to come to the fore are a number of other problems that community residents are raising. For example, as we stabilize the housing, what do we do around youth problems? And when young people have no place to hang out, what happens? In Greenpoint, Williamsburg, what, as, as the residents come to you, come to St. Nick's, what do they see as their highest priority as they're going forward? And g could you give our audience some notion of what, what ethnic mix you've got and sure. what's going on? Sure. Um, Williamsburg Greenpoint is uh, perhaps one of the most interesting communities in the city. It's one of the uh, most uh, diverse. Uh, uh, we're about 40% uh, uh, Latino, 40% uh, Italian American, 10% uh, uh, African American, 10% uh, Polish, and then we have a large Hasidic community uh, in our immediate adjoining area, right. so it makes it uh, very interesting a community to work in. Mm. Um, the problems faced by our residents can vary. Uh, we, um, as, as Richie had talked about, still work in buildings where the landlords have walked away or stopped providing services. So on any given day, we can have someone come in and uh, uh, present similar issues uh, to us. And we work in the own ownership transfer program, too, to help tenants organize and, and pass mm -hmm. buildings into uh, back to the tax rolls. Um, we can have someone that's looking for a job, uh, someone that's uh, caught up in the 
uh, welfare to work um, uh, uh, bureaucracy that hasn't been able to find a job and we're there to help them with that. Uh, we can have a neighborhood resident who's always wanted to start a business and we can assist them in, in learning how to develop a business plan and start up a business enterprise. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we've developed about 1,500 units of housing. We manage about 900, so we have a lot of, uh, we're a landlord too, and sometimes we have to deal with um, right. landlord-tenant issues. Uh, uh, we um, uh, managing housing is tough, and uh, so we're struggling with many of the uh, issues in managing the building, as well as the environment around uh, drugs, perhaps on the street in some locations, and those kinds of issues are things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Both you gentlemen, I mean, these are a time where you go look at any newspaper and, and, and talk to many people in Central Manhattan, and feel that this is the best time the city has ever had. I mean. Uh, has there been a trickle down to these neighborhoods? Do, are people uh, moving? Uh, are they getting employment? Uh, what's it like? What's going to happen, of course? Uh, are, do you have many welfare poor uh, who are coming, uh, going to be facing the end of time limits? Uh, Richie, you want to? Well, in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant as a whole, um, the unemployment rate, when the city's unemployment rate was 10 percent, the unemployment rate in Bed-Stuy was 17 percent. And so in that, in that regard, at least, we're not seeing a real change. And the historic uh, ratio where the unemployment rate in the black and Latino community is almost double that of the entire city, that's, that still carries. Uh, and even more serious uh, than the general unemployment rate is the unemployment rate for young people. In this community in particular, we've got, um, we've got a sizable number of people who have completed high school, 29% of the folks. But we also have 44% of the adults who have not completed high school. So there's a real need for continuing education programs mm -hmm. for young people and adults, for GED programs, all kinds of alternative educational programs. And um, at, the sa at the same time, um, there's a, a need for job creation, both in the community as well as in the larger city, targeted towards those community residents and job preparedness programs. That are there. Michael, you talked about some job creation. Mm -hmm. how, how are St. Nick's uh, handling that, that issue, the need well, for jobs? Um, it's a major critical issue for us. About a third of our residents are dependent on public assistance in some uh, form. Yeah. Uh, and there's, although the city's economy has uh, performed uh, reasonably well, largely, I guess, as a result of the uh, growth of the stock market and so yeah. forth. Uh, it's very difficult for many of our residents to enter that uh, job market and there's a big gap in terms of skills and opportunities uh, there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work specifically to close that gap and to provide connections to employment. Uh, some of the things that we're attempting to uh, do is that we've organized uh, Williamsburg-wide, a uh, Greater Williamsburg Collaborative, specifically to focus on uh, creating new employment opportunities and providing access to large numbers of jobs. Uh, we realize that in placing 350 people a year, which we do through our employment and training right. program, it's only a drop in the bucket. So um, we're looking to form partnerships with uh, major employers in Manhattan, uh, bring new training resources, which are almost non-existent uh, these days, and mm. specifically to, uh, to focus on assisting those people that are on public assistance, which um, where there are really no transitional resources in some respects available to them. Now, we, you haven't seen yet, I guess, the impact of the welfare reform time limits yet, but I know that this area particularly has a large number of inflow of new immigrants yes. coming in. Uh, many of them are specifically excluded from the, the, the Welfare Supports uh, Act because of the Congress's action. Are you starting to see more people who uh, are, uh, need supports of some sort but who can't, are not allowed to get it? Uh, we've worked with uh, uh, Brooklyn Legal Services, and in fact, um, we're mm -hmm. the administrators of the uh, Williamsburg Beacon School. And uh, one of the initiatives we're uh, starting this month, in fact, is um, uh, that uh, Brooklyn Legal Services will begin providing legal assistance to people who've lost their welfare benefits who, for one reason or another, uh, have not been able to uh, wean their way through the bureaucracy. Um, so that'll serve, uh, we're hoping, as a safety net, uh, and they work in tandem with our employment folks, so we're trying to work with folks on both, uh, you know, on both avenues. Um, uh, we do have a substantially new immigrant population, and they are amongst the poorest in our community. They are frequently not eligible for public housing, and they're not eligible for a range of benefits, and in our housing organizing, that's a substantial focus of that effort now, is working with those populations. Mm -hmm. Richie, uh, in terms of talking to our tenants uh, who we're, we're trying to work with, uh, as they prioritize things, they clearly want their housing uh, set, what's the next thing they're, they're pushing for? Jobs and youth, and youth services. Yeah. And, um, 
and I think this is, we'll probably see this around the city as on the top priorities. And um, I'm not going to, since we've already talked a little about jobs, job creation, I think the problem, this problems are pretty much the same in Bed-Stuy as they are in other inner city communities. Mm -hmm. um, the youth issue is one of particular significance in that, in, that the slashing of youth programs and youth monies around the city has had an impact on the uh, ability of local um, youth service providers to expand the base of their services. And uh, we've been fortunate in finding groups like the Jackie Robinson uh, Youth Program uh, there, as well as the Bed-Stuy Cultural Program, um, to begin to give to give op to create openings for some of the kids from Bed-Stuy. Recently, 100 black men gave us scholarships for their SAT training program. So along with our local partners, Long Life Information and Referral Service and Black Vets for Social Justice, one of the things that we're looking at that has come jumped on the agenda immediately is how do we expand the services that are available for young people and how do we learn from other communities to see what, what they've done, like for the issue of Beacon Schools, for example, and after school programs, as well as uh, athletic leagues. I, in, in the a measure of the revealing things, I, I can't say I don't know this neighborhood in Gates Avenue. I grew up about 12 or 13 blocks uh, from it on, on Dean Street between us and New York, so I know a lot of the issues here. But during my time, which is now ancient history, as my children always tell me, um, uh, we had the St. John's Community Center where basically there wasn't a moment uh, that we weren't engaged uh, when we got home mm -hmm. in something. There was something going on, and you came home exhausted, basically, right. uh, when you got out of uh, the, and the, it was getting dark. Um, now, of course, uh, the, the options for youth services, at least in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and I think other parts of the, uh, the city have become a little more restricted. What about uh, youth services and what St. Nick's is, is doing on that front? Uh, this is an area which we saw it needed, uh, badly needed attention. Um, uh, uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, when we began our housing rehabilitation work many years ago, there really were no youth programs uh, to speak of at all. And uh, we have been um, able to um, uh, uh, take responsibility for Beacon Center in our community. Right. Uh, and I think there's finally a recognition that you have to have youth services. Uh, and the city has started to, although there's been some cuts, uh, this month they're planning the expansion of uh, 20 new uh, beacon centers around the city, uh, two more in Williamsburg and Greenpoint, in fact, in addition to the one that's already uh, up and operating. Uh, they're huge resources. They're a central part of the life of the community. Uh, right. In our case, uh, we run a program when we thought, when we planned it initially, we thought we'd be happy if we served 2,000 youth and their families. We serve almost 6,000 youth and their families. and. Um, we see it, that as a key resource, but we need to build on the voluntary um, uh, 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 leaders within our neighborhood. And one of the most uh, pleasing things to me and most rewarding things is to see the number of neighborhood volunteers that have come forward right. organizing youth leagues. And the Beacon provides uh, uh, where it happened to be located in the Grant Street campus, which is a 4,000-seat right. city public high school, uh, probably with the best youth facility, uh, athletic facility, so we have a big AstroTurf field. Yep. Uh, and that field is used all day Saturday, every day uh, during the week. Um, we have over 20 athletic groups now using it from right. basketball, tennis, soccer, Little League, um, uh, football. It's an incredible thing to see happen when we think 10 years ago nothing existed. Talking about that, interesting, you, you mentioned earlier in, in the program that you have such a diverse racial mix. How, how is this all coming together under St. Nick's? You've gotten, you have some communities that have not necessarily worked very well together over time. Uh, how does it work? How, how is it working for you and how, what was your uh, prescription for bringing this all together? Uh, I certainly was, I'm not responsible uh, <laughs> for that. Um, but there are many other community leaders that are. I think a couple of things are critical. Uh, one is I see a genuine respect amongst all groups for leaders. And uh, uh, we've had the benefit of seeing people involved over five or 10 year period mm -hmm. so that within our community, everyone knows everyone else, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in Williamsburg, is because it is so di diverse, there's not one group that dominates. Right. So all groups need to, Work the together. alliances with other uh, uh, groups within the neighborhood that helps. Uh, uh, we have issues such as uh, the expansion of waste transfer facilities yeah. and so forth. Uh, and so that people come together around those issues and they've found strength in that. And I think, uh, um, unlike other communities, we've avoided a lot of conflict, uh, physical conflict in our neighborhood.
I don't know if many of you, uh, our viewers may not be aware, Richie, but uh, the monies that used to go for substantial rehab of housing have virtually been eliminated. Uh, what kind of impact, how are we looking at trying to get the resources necessary to rehabilitate and create, uh, you know, uh, raise up substandard units into first-class bankable units? Well, part of, in our particular situation on Gates Avenue, part of this is uh, the responsibility of HUD and the federal um, agency um, since these are properties that um, for a long time have been in their purview. And But even with um, what we expect from them, I think that we're still going to have to go into the private market and look for assistance there as well. And so this is, these are the things that we're exploring now. And but one, one, of the, one of the points that was just made that I think is really important is, is um, the amount of years that this takes that there is no easy panacea. 22 years That's in where we get case. the gray hair from. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that, um, no, we're not looking you know, so young sometimes, either. Sometimes people say, well, um, what have you done? And we've, we've been in this area for a year, and we're beginning to identify a lot of problems. But we're a baby compared, compared to, to like, St. Nick's, for example. Yeah. And there are a number of other uh, agencies and models around the city that we have a lot to learn from, um, including how do we leverage money for the repair uh, and for the rehab of units. And um, so when we say we've been there a year, we think that we've laid a pretty good foundation. And it's been primarily through the efforts of uh, organizers and the tenants themselves that we have two strong um, tenant associations and that are beginning as their own lives and their own housing situation stabilize to start looking at the, at the larger community and start asking questions and start starting to take an inventory of what are the resources that are available for them and their, and their children. Yeah. What impact on, on you at, at St. Nick's of the cutback in federal housing dollars and other dollars actually that it, used to uh, support this kind of a... It has slowed our housing development to a, a trickle, uh, frankly. Um, but there are a couple of very important things I think to focus on. Uh, one, CSS has a fabulous program in the ownership transfer uh, uh, initiative, uh, which um, has been very helpful to us, uh, where we think additional resources, public resources, should be directed. Uh, we were in a building uh, just last uh, week, um, uh, extremely bad shape, uh, needs about $40,000 a unit, and uh, most of the city programs that used to allow for that rehab are no longer there, and the tenants and ourselves are basically on our own to try to figure out how to piece together right. enough money to get the building back to some kind of habitable uh, condition. Um, other, um, uh, most of our development work, uh, what little there is, can take us five to seven years. It's uh, such a competitive process of applying and reapplying to uh, uh, even complete, uh, you know, a 20-unit new development. Uh, we still have a very acute housing shortage. Um, uh, there's, uh, our community grew uh, in the last census by about 13%. Uh, but the housing stock only ex expanded. That's when we went through the biggest, uh, biggest housing boom. rehab yeah. uh, by about 8%. So there's still an acute shortage. Uh, one uh, positive uh, thing that's happened or developed in the past year is the Build New York campaign. And that's a uh, statewide initiative. Um, our Assemblyman Vito Lopez has right. taken the lead in that. Uh, and our statewide groups are, f are fighting for a substantial expansion of the state role in housing development. And we're hoping to see uh, new resources uh, flow from that uh, initiative. And we think this is a good year for the program to, to uh, uh, be adopted by the governor and the legislature, which will provide us with additional funds for housing development. When I first talked to you, Mike, it was interesting that uh, I didn't know as much about the St. Nick's program as, as I should have. Is there an effort to collaborate between different neighborhoods throughout the city that are struggling with the same sets of issues, though, each in a different... It, it's interesting. We don't see a, sort of a holistic, whether it's the city, perhaps it can't happen, mm -hmm. uh, brings everyone together to start talking and trading notes even about how you've handled your problems. I know it's already been extraordinarily helpful to us mm -hmm. as we start to look at our baby steps in terms of beverage stops. Um, but it's interesting. I'm interested that there doesn't seem to be as much communication as I perhaps would have expected. Uh, we're not, uh, and I'm wondering how that fits. Have, we've seen some other programs, I know, Richie, that we begin to begun to look at. I think what we have is uh, informal networks among people who have worked on things and have come into contact with each other. But I mean, a lot a lot needs to be done, and I think that's pretty pretty true in a number of areas in the city. And uh, it's usually under crisis that people are kind of thrown together to figure out mm -hmm. as the resources begin to disappear, is there anything that we can do to help each other? Do you have a, a methodology that maybe we can use 
um, that'll be beneficial or how do we learn from learn from each other what about the waste issue you have an environmental problem in Greenport Williamsburg that's perhaps as serious as any in the city mm -hmm. how is that played into your your efforts to revitalize this community um, Williamsburg Greenpoint uh, was either blessed or is the bane of the concentration of um, M3 property <coughs> in the city, which has right. uh, uh, permitted the growth of uh, waste transfer stations. Um, and the decision to close the Fresh Kills uh, facility has uh, now pushed uh, that the burden of handling that uh, waste to um, you know to the boroughs and the individual uh, communities. Um, it's a uh, we all have to live with uh, waste. Um, it is a uh, it is an issue we confront. It generates a substantial truck traffic, and uh, we're attempting to come to terms with that. On the other hand, it's a, been a very large job creator mm -hmm. and is um, uh, uh, the largest probably single uh, growth of jobs. Um, we have companies now employing 800 people in this and field. And I assume pretty high wage jobs. Uh, at their entry level, no skill uh, jobs are about $8 an hour. So, uh, and with right. the growth, there's been lots of opportunity for, um, uh, but we need to uh, reconcile that, um, uh, that you know, job growing activity with uh, the environmental concerns of our community. And I think we're attempting to come together. Uh, sometimes we're, um, you know, pressured from big, uh, the larger city issues and the city policies and so forth and attempting to make sure that our community uh, doesn't become overwhelmed by these activities. So um, it's a difficult balancing act to uh, try to yeah. reach the right uh, point. How did, how did St. Nick's get started? Where's, where are the resources that keep you obviously operating? Um, we uh, were started when a fire destroyed a, uh, destroyed a row of housing, uh, left 18 families homeless, and the people from the St. Nick's Church pitched in to mm -hmm. uh, help. Uh, uh, they, uh, the houses burned to the ground, uh, typical of uh, what happened in much of Williamsburg and Bushwick uh, during those years. And this group became determined that there, were, there had to be some way to rebuild that housing. And uh, the state had abandoned a nine-story building nearby, and that became the group's uh, focus. And um, taking one step at a time, but with a lot of determination, uh, they eventually rehabbed this building and created 150 units of senior housing. And I think that really empowered them as a group to think, hey, right. you know, we we're just this. ordinary people, and look what we were able to produce. Uh, it only took them five years. It might take us eight, nine years today. Uh, but um, uh, they, uh, from that, we began to learn about how to do development. Uh, uh, our focus has always been one of organizing and mobilizing, and so that. Uh, that's been our focus in housing and economic development and health care as well as in youth uh, activities because uh, we believe that organized infrastructure is really the sustaining effort of community development, uh, not just the building uh, process itself. Our tenant leadership uh, in, in Bed-Stuy has been through a number of iterations. Uh, how was it when we were trying to get people on the tenants uh, committee uh, uh, to buy you know, into yet another uh, It's almost like the effort. voters in New York have had so many promises made to <laughs> them and uh, the tenants had, had seen a lot of people come and go and generally like take the money and run. Uh, the failure of um, federal agencies to really oversee the people that were getting the subsidies and um, they had seen a number of attempts at tenant associations that had collapsed over the years mostly because the landlords undermined them and were just intransigent. And so there was a it wasn't apathy at all. It was a high level of disgust and distrust mm -hmm. that needed to be overcome. And I think that's important for like for all organizers that very, very often people in poor communities are said to be apathetic. And our experience is that it's not apathy. It's that people have had experiences and they've made some really? very real judgments about their sense of, of their ability to make change. Um, but people were willing to try again. And this time around, we were able to actually take root. It's a lot of old time organizing door to door stuff um, the internet doesn't help us <laughs> in, uh, in this so much much of uh, the internet is the panacea for all oh, social problems it doesn't really apply this is people to people work and it co it's very labor intensive it's human okay. intensive and it takes a long a long period of time to gain people's trust and to engage in a kind of a, it's a community building process that takes place first in a small microcosm where people begin to exercise self-government. And uh, that takes a long time. And, you know, and some of it has to do with acquiring skills, of, you know, like technical stuff like running a meeting and how do you reach consensus when you have you know, feuds going on. And, and then there are some very hard decisions that need to be grappled with um, about security and buildings. Um, 
Some yeah. people say immediately, you know, we need photo IDs. There are many people who object to photo IDs for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the issue that we always use as an example, um, once the, the building security has been found, um, who, is, who can sit out front? Who hangs out? So generally people are not upset if the older residents sit outside in the nice weather, uh, but then what about the young women with children? Can they sit outside? And then if everyone else is sitting outside, what about why, the young why men? The why can they sit outside and the teenagers? And these are questions that the tenants, questions like these the tenants grapple with. Um, and it is an exercise in self-government and an exercise in, in democratic process. But while this is all happening, there's also an outside uh, antagonist that has to be dealt with. So it's not like you have t forever to work out this process because you're also battling against slumlords and um, very often uh, a, a federal government or local government that is, is at best neutral, but very often is on the side of the slumlords. So it's, I think it's a very heroic effort. And to see folks come forward and give of their time um, night after night and uh, to grapple with really hard questions to try to figure out like the ins and outs and, of strategy and tactics around lawsuits and things right. like that. It, it goes echoes back, uh, you know, starting with a small achievable result and then people start to become empowered and say, I can do more than this. Yes. Uh, that seems to be the, the theme that runs through all these successful mm -hmm. efforts. I wish we could bring it to scale for every neighborhood sure. in the city that has problems like this, and maybe that's uh, something we have to but discuss next. One of the next. things that has happened in, in the Gates Avenue area is that people are now getting the sense, well, wow, we really can do this. We mm -hmm. really can hold ourselves together. We can accomplish. We can get rid of these slum lords. So maybe there are other things that we can do. Mike, where, what do you hope in a very short period well, to I, take I, this? I appreciate next? that you've given me uh, and Richard the opportunity to speak today, but it really is happening in communities uh, throughout the city. It's not as, uh, there isn't as much attention on the positive things, but right. there are maybe 60 or so community development corporations like ours throughout the city, and we are working with other communities through the Community Trust uh, right. with Washington Heights and Mott Haven on a larger project which is focused on welfare to work. Um, so there are very many positive things, and what we're doing in Williamsburg is, uh, I think, is a movement throughout the city and perhaps throughout the nation uh, that is rebuilding our cities in a way that uh, didn't happen in the 60s is happening now. Terrific. Many things go into making a neighborhood livable. Well-maintained housing, nearby stores, parks, activities for the kids, municipal services. Loss of any one factor can start a community's decline, but it doesn't have to happen that way. Here in New York, we have the resources to stop neighborhoods from going downhill. All we need to do is shift the focus a little. Instead of concentrating solely on upgrading Wall Street, we could and will divert some help to residential streets in Brooklyn, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx. This is David R. Jones. Thank you for joining us on the Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.